On the southernmost tip of Africa, on the very edge of the world, lies a true paradise on Earth. Cape Town, South Africa. An enigmatic city with its feet in the ocean and its head in the clouds. Many secrets lie in the city's heart. Cape Town, sea level, on top of the mountain, a thousand meters. It's quite a big jump. The pain of the recent past is part of life here, but with boundless optimism, Cape Townians embrace the excitement of the present and the promise of the future. People often look at the township and see it as this dark, scary place, but it's such a lie, it's such mm. a terrible perspective. Cape Town has a rough surface, but maybe only to protect the vibrant pulse of creativity and vitality underneath. I'm eager to uncover the city's hidden stories. When we make wine here, we have very little to do. The wine makes itself, and it's a great wine. A refreshingly rich and complex culture. African roots entangle with the remnants of British and Dutch colonial rule. This port city is poised to take on its role of African ambassador to the Western world. Although Andrew Borain was born in Durban, 1,700 kilometers to the east, he fell in love with Cape Town. This passion is now his livelihood, as he helps Cape Townians rediscover their origins. We're in St. George's Mall now, and it's the main pedestrian thoroughfare. It's the kind of heart of the city here for people to walk. It's a tradition that goes back 300 years. This used to be called Eersteberg Doarstraat, which in Dutch means first mountain cross street. And today it's a very popular pedestrian walk to get you almost from the mountain to the sea. What is the distance between the sea and the mountain? Well, it's changed over the years. Just down here is a place called Strand Street. Now, Strand, the Strand in Dutch is beach. So the waves used to beat against the city quite close to where we are now. And if you look at the, the, the cities, the street names, C Street, Jetty Street, Vatikant, which means waterside street, just around the corner, um, that's where the sea was. Now it's been pushed out at least another two kilometers. So we kind of lost connection between the mountain and the sea. The landfill doubled the distance. The landfill started in about 1939, uh, when they decided to build a big industrial harbor and we then built a huge big uh, highway in the 1960s and 70s which again cut us off and we need to reconnect. The waterfront has done that to some extent. The city's revitalization began here, at the Victoria and Alfred waterfront. The conversion of this historic working harbor into a shopping and leisure destination has created the city's trendiest hotspot. We've tended to turn our back on the port, which is our origins. I mean, we were known as the Tavern of the Seas. Lawrence Green, a famous author, coined this phrase, I think in the 1940s. The lovely term, meaning this is where everyone came and drank and, you know, kind of met each other. I love that, the Tavern of the Seas. <laughs> yeah, that really summarizes, I mean, if you think of where people have come from to Cape Town, it's not just from Europe. The original inhabitants of Cape Town, apart from the company settlers under Jan van Riebeck, were slaves. Where did they come from? They came from Indonesia? East Africa, or Indonesia, Java, Sumatra, Bengal, so from India, uh, 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 East Africa, and Madagascar. The Dutch East India Company were the, the first ones to rebrand and market this place. If you think of it, for centuries, this place was called the Place of Storms, or the Cape of Storms and it was a place to be feared by um, sailors. Now you try and set up a settlement and encourage people to come all the way from Europe to this little settlement when it's called the Cape of Storms. So what did they do? They said, no, 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 it's the Cape of Good Hope. And they were a brilliant marketing company of their time. <laughs> and they renamed it successfully, so people came here. 
we are the mother city, so we are the originator of much of the other settlement, human settlement, human habitat in uh, South Africa. Where you were standing for most of its life, it was a green market, a Grunte Mark. And it was where citizens, but in particular slaves of the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch settlers at that time would come and meet here to buy the fruit and vegetables. And it was the only place that slaves could convert. When they read out the Emancipation Proclamation for Slavery in 1834, it was on the square. It's very much where we celebrate heritage and history of Cape Town. But a lot of the buildings uh, on the outskirts of the central city still follow the original Cape Dutch architecture. So we've got uh, Dutch, we've got um, uh, British colonial history, and then more modern South African architecture. You'll see, for example, these buildings here are arts and crafts or art deco buildings. We've got some of the best examples of the 1930s arts deco movement in the world. So we're quite proud of it. How do the population movements change the face of the city? The, the population of the central city is lower today than it was in the 1960s. That's the tragedy. That's what apartheid did. One of our problems is urban sprawl. I mean, Cape Town, the physical geography of Cape Town is about 2,400 square kilometers. So it's, it's, it stretches for miles, and we have one of the lowest urban densities in the world because we followed the good old suburbanization model, which pushed people out. So we've got a very imbalanced and skewed city. There used to be a lot more people living in the city. In the 1960s, we had a place called District 6, which was a mixed population. And under the Group Areas Act of the National Party Apartheid Government, they declared it a so-called white group areas, and they kicked 60,000 people out of the city. And to this day, we have land claims of people wanting to come back into the city. So in a sense, there was a depopulation counter to normal uh, urban growth. Uh, as a result of the apartheid policies. And we're still recovering from that wound today. So obviously one of our goals is to bring people back into the city, including the original inhabitants from District 6. But, you know, with rising land prices and the property market, that's not an easy thing to do. By 1986, more than 700,000 people had been forced from their homes and relocated to the outskirts of the city. Without reliable drinking water or electricity, these neighborhoods quickly became slums be a very strong critic of the apartheid system. And then people would try and march through the streets. And um, obviously the security police of the time, I'm talking about sort of the late 70s and 1980s, the security police of the apartheid government were just clamped down. And uh, for many, many years, all protests and all marches were completely uh, banned. 1989, uh, in, the, in the dying years of the apartheid regime, people started getting bolder about these marches and they, they gathered in the street and lined up against them were the, the, the police, what we call caspers, who are the armored vehicles. And on top of the, one of them was a, a, a purple dye spray. What happened is that one member of the crowd got up on top of this um, water cannon and turned it against the police and drenched them with this purple dye. And one of our slogans of the time was, the people shall govern. But next day, when we all came into town, up on the wall, there was a big um, uh, bit of graffiti written, the purple shall govern. We have recreated that story with some public art now. So this is called, the purple shall govern. And we're very proud of it. The purple shall govern. The purple shall govern, yes. Robben Island, perhaps more than any other place here, is haunted by history. During European settlement, it was used to isolate lepers and convicts. More recently, it was a prison for anti-government activists. Edward Daniels spent 15 years locked up here, on an island that has become a symbol of isolation, a symbol of apartheid. The name uh, Robben Island, it's actually derived from the Dutch name of the island, which was Robbe Eiland. Don't tell me, does it mean seal? Yes, it means seal. So the island was covered in seals. 
Do you come back here often? I have come back here many, many times. Initially, I suppose uh, it was quite nostalgic to come back. But the point is, you know, we not only survived, we actually won the war. So you come back, you don't come back to gloat, but you got the feeling of, of satisfaction, you see? Was Mandela already here when you came? Yes, he was here three months ahead of me. And how did you first meet? Well, you know, I, I was the only prisoner of my organization to come to jail alone. I was isolated from everybody else initially. And after five days, I was allowed to work with other people in the yard chopping stones. And as I was making my way to the bathroom, my progress was stopped by this big man in front of me. And I looked up and I said, Hello, Mr. Mandela. And he says, the name is Nelson. Welcome. Apartheid is an Afrikaans word, meaning to live apart. On Robben Island, that happened for many political prisoners. They were separated from their families and from their people. But perhaps the isolation fueled the movement because here the prisoners formed close ties, strengthening their resolve. This is where you worked. Yeah, yeah, this is where you worked, yes. So this is the type of work you would do. And you would bang the, you sit in a brick, and you would bang the gravel into, into gravel. This, of course, is Mr. Madara and Mr. Sisulu. It was here that the future president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, spent 18 of his 27 years in prison. It was also here that the ideological seeds were sown for a new vision of his country. This is the B section of the uh, prison, maximum, maximum security section. This is where we were locked up most of the time for 23 hours of the day, weekends. Half an hour exercise in the morning, half an hour exercise in the afternoon. The security was very, very tight. This is Mr. Mandela's cell. This is where he spent his 18 years, you see? My cell is way up there, where I spent 15 years. And this is exactly what it was like? There's no mattress, it's just a... No, that's just, just, just that. Mr. Mandela did get a bed later. That's on doctor's orders. Susula got a bed, Katrada got a bed. I never got a bed, so I slept on the floor all 15 years. What did Nelson Mandela teach you in prison? Mr. Mandela taught me integrity, taught me dignity. So Mr. Mandela's very presence was almost, you know, it was a privilege just being with him. Wonderful, wonderful man. Nelson Mandela and Edward Daniels were held in maximum security, restrained even from visiting the prison soccer field. The rest of the convicts were allowed to play the national sport, and they used their time on the secluded field to plan political mobilization to confront the regime. Apartheid was abolished more than 15 years ago, but the effects of an oppressive government don't just disappear. The townships, these slums, home to hundreds of thousands of Cape Tonians, show how a history of separation has affected the here and now. The townships ring the city and are home to more than half of its population. During apartheid, these families were torn from their homes in the center of the city and exiled to the outskirts. It's hard to tell that democracy has been established for more than 20 years. Clearly, more must be done. So this is your restaurant? Yep, this is it, Subanya. What does it mean? It means together we are one. So irrespective of whether you're black, white, Chinese, doesn't together matter. Together we are one. In Hout Bay, the hope for change exists in people like Nathan Roberts and Randy McKnight, two visionary businessmen who run a restaurant in this rough neighborhood. This is considered a safe township. It's yeah. one of the safer one townships, of the safe. yeah. But there are issues here. Yeah. Yeah. We started the restaurant here because it's such a loving place. And mm. if people just break that, that initial barrier, they, mm. they get to know the people for who they are, not, mm. not for who they think they are or what they associate with the people. It's, yeah. The positive things far outweigh the negatives, you know? Like, mm. there's such a sense of community. There's a community sense amongst the older people with relation to younger people. It's a very culturally rich yeah. community, you know? And so, there's a lot of love here. People, people often look at the township and see it as this 
dark, scary place, but it's such a lie. It's such mm. a terrible perspective. And it's ridiculous that we're discussing this 15 years after we've achieved our democracy and we should be a united society, but mm. actually it's still so divided. And to break that is a, it's an active thing. It's not a passive thing. You can't mm. expect these things to change overnight. I was the first white guy to open a restaurant or any business in Mandela yeah, Park. Like, yeah. And that was hectic. And people were like, oh, mm. initially. And through that, things just melt. People open up and yeah. now we have my friends yeah, come and visit all the time. Plenty of white guys come inside now, walk around, some tourists, plenty of them. The complex relationship between blacks and whites still appears to be based on old fears and mistrust. And changing these attitudes is no easy task. So why do the townships have such a bad reputation? I think the townships since apartheid have been a very contentious place because they were made places for the black people to move and stay away from the white people. There were a whole lot of riots when the transition happened uh, from a white and government to a black run government. If people don't like things, they act as a community. So through issues like xenophobia or uh, crime, they get a bad name. Now, very few people are involved in crime here, but that's the only experience of a lot of white people in relation to the township. And since I've come into Mandela Park, I've not come across any of those yeah. things. You know, it's over time, it makes white people feel better about not entering into the township, not taking the chance to get to know people, you know. We've got 16,000 people who live here in Mandela Park, about, whereas in the rest of Hart Bay, I think it's a similar number. And the size of Mandela Park relative to the rest of Hart Bay is ridiculous, you know. You're living four or five people to a one room. It's a scary reality when you compare Mandela Park to 200 meters away. If you look here, that's a shack that maybe how many people, two to three people would stay in. And then, is that right? Yeah. Two or three people would stay in there. And then across the valley we have houses which cost multi, multiple millions of rands. People often have too much money. Mm. And a lot of our idea or a lot of our vision was to make those people meet and realize that the people across the valley can earn a lot in terms of culture, in terms of community, in terms of relationship, mm. from having a relationship with the people across the valley. And the people on this side can benefit from having opportunities or monetary support to be able to realize their dreams. Government programs aim to help build more affordable and livable housing. But with such a dense population, the work is colossal. You don't have a house. How long have you been waiting? A long time I'm waiting, and my mother also waiting 30 years for a house. 30, 30, 30 years? 30 years my mother used to stay here in Bissau So where do people live in the time if they don't have a house? Yeah, uh, sure. Even me, I already registered my own, my own house, but yeah, I'm still young, but <laughs> it's not going to come out now. Randy isn't about to lose hope. He invites me to his house to see the harshness of life in the ghetto. Uh, Heidi, this is where I live. That's the room over there with the pink. You know? yeah. We love pink, but anyway, this is where I live. I'd like to welcome you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is the place I sleep. Yeah. Rev sleep on this bed. And my friend Bongani sleeps on this bed. Yeah. <laughs> and I sleep on the floor. Because <laughs> I came last in the house. But so I sleep on the floor. This is my sponge. This is my space. This is my space. No one step on my space except me. <laughs> he lives here, in these two small rooms with five others. No water, no sewer, no floor. In Randy's smile, there is optimism, pride, and hope. A spirit like his seems big enough to change the country all by itself. I move on to Kailicha. Established in 1985, it's the youngest and fastest growing township in Cape Town. It houses more than 400,000. The locals have warned me that it's too dangerous to get out of the car. But I'm curious. If danger is everywhere, how can this eccentric, friendly-looking fruit market exist here? Luxalo Kunku welcomes me with open arms. He even offers to walk me through the maze that is Kailicha. He wants to show me that the township's reputation is far from the truth. Can you show us inside the town? This is TR section. It starts from that side of the Deba. I look out here. This is a road to a train station. 
These people you see uh, are from work. Some of them are students. They use this road to travel to the train station. It's part of Kaili Chayu. Yes, Kailich so. is the name of the township? Yes, it's the name of the township. What's it like to live here? I personally believe that hey, sometimes you just need to accept where you live and then be ambitious of what you want. But, you know, this is it, yeah. A lot of other things too that, that are going on here in this place because there's too much crime, so on, and a whole lot of other things, you see. Did it improve here since the end of apartheid in 94? Yes, yes, in a way I would say, because uh, at night there are like um, petroleum, petroleum groups that, that go around, around the community and watch the neighbors, if whether they are safe or anything. They are trying to improve the community. But um, people are still in waiting, because I think it's over like 25 years now we've been promised that the, the Department of Housing would give out houses to us, but then up until now we've been waiting. And we are in Cape Town. This is Cape Town. As I leave the townships, it's fitting that I meet Mokena Makeka, an architect working with the government to build structures like this community center. The construction provides employment for the locals, and the building will give them a space to gather and engage socially. I'm so surprised that 16 years after the end of apartheid, after the first democratic election mm -hmm. in South Africa, that you have little shacks and these slums and, you know, six <laughs> or more people living yeah, in a tiny yeah. space. Cape Town is the epitome of contradictions. You know, whether you arrive at the airport and then two kilometers later, all of a sudden, there's shacks. And then two kilometers later, you have very expensive houses as soon as you're back into town, you have some amazing architecture, but then on the back end, you could go to Hard Bay, and all of a sudden, you find you have shacks again. So that sense of contradiction, that sense of juxtaposition, and that sense of difference in quite a close locale makes Cape Town very unique. And this community project built by Makena is also very unique, especially in a neighborhood like Kailicha. It was a real test of uh, a couple of ideas about what could a building be inside a township. Very often people have a sort of negative attitude about how to design in townships because the township has always been seen as a negative space, a problematic space, a space of crime. Townships were never really invested in terms of, you know, business development, entrepreneurship, social facilities. They were created as dormitory towns and almost as a political device to ensure that the population could be controlled. So this gesture and this building is the beginnings of a new type of urbanism and city making to transform these um, dysfunctional, you know, human settlements into something far much more humane. The thing that makes the the building fascinating for me is that one, there was a very strong public participation process where people came in and they voted and they said what type of building would they want. That was the first thing. And then second, the, the reaction has been so wonderful that there's been no vandalism on the building. People use it very well and the community say, you know what, we're going to take care of this building for the next 20 years. So that means that there's a sense of civic pride um, in, in the building which one could even argue that maybe 10, 15 years ago civic pride in townships was probably absent because in fact buildings represented the state so you often attacked buildings you often vandalized them to express your discomfort and now there's a total uh, change in culture the city is empty and it's a pity because it's so beautiful it is about the dream of what a city is it's the mother city which you've got table mountain you have robin island you have all these things but it's fundamentally inaccessible because of an inability to really look at how can we create housing for all if you look at it from a time frame uh, cape town and new york were almost settled at pretty similar times you know by the dutch and if you look at what happened in manhattan and new york the united states and look at it's amazing how the ethics of a place and how it deals with space and how it deals with its people can have a remarkable long-term impact on what that city actually becomes. Mokena has reason to be optimistic about Kailicha's future. He's actually helping to build it himself. One of the largest wine producers in the world, South Africa has its greatest concentration of vineyards in Cape Town. The climate and rich soil quality have attracted countless European winemakers. Jean-Vincent Ridon is one of them. 
Cape Town is a big village. The population is around 3 million, maybe a bit more, but the real center and its residential sectors represent something like 30,000 people. We're limited by the size. On one side there's a mountain and on the other there's the ocean. That's why the city is still on a human scale. People can walk and shop in the little boutiques. You won't find that in Durban or Johannesburg. And here it is, Le Clos d'Orange. Between ocean and mountain, the grapes grow in near-perfect conditions. Cape Town's founder, Jan van Riebeck, was the first to make wine here in the 17th century. And by the 18th century, Cape Town wine was among the most sought after in the world. This is the only vineyard in the center of town. It's in the historical bowl of Cape Town. It's the only one. They began tearing vines down after the big phylloxera attack in 1895 and continued until 1905. The last vines were removed in 1963, and I replanted here in 2001, where vines should have been all along. Carried across the Atlantic from America, phylloxera destroyed vines in Europe. It spread throughout Asia and eventually ended up here, at the tip of the African continent. When we make wine here, we have very little to do. The wine makes itself, and it's a great wine. If I planted in the sand by the ocean, it would probably make a horrible wine. It'd be made with as much love on my behalf, but it just wouldn't be good. Grapes aren't the only crop brought here by the Europeans. Jean-Vincent takes me to Company's Garden Park, a magnificent green space in the heart of the city. The company's garden was initially created as a restocking garden by the Dutch when they first arrived. Cape Town was the place to restock ships with vegetables, meat and fresh water. In order to test the soil, they planted the first carrots, the first tomatoes and so forth to see what would grow. The first oak trees were also planted in order to repair the ships. The first vines were planted in 1652, somewhere around us, right here in these gardens. And then 350 years ago, in 1659, the first wine was made in Cape Town. We make our way to Le Caveau to see the importance of wine in Cape Town. Jean-Yves, owner of this fantastic wine bar, offers hundreds of wines by the glass, all local and all as surprising and original as the city itself. Exporting 500 million liters of wine each year, it's easy to see why the South Africans have a hard time getting their hands on local wine. Last year, we celebrated the 350th anniversary of wine in South Africa, and we are the seventh or eighth in the world for quantity produced. It's a small area. Only 100,000 hectares are planted. It's the size of the Bordeaux region, or about one-third of the Languedoc-Roussillon. It's a small region concentrated around Cape Town because the climate and the geography between the mountains and the ocean are convenient for the vines. We can't really expand like the New World, like Brazil and Argentina, that still have so much unused land. Europeans have played a key role in Cape Town's winemaking industry. But where do black Africans fit in? For too long, they have been refused their share of land and its agricultural potential. But change has come to all aspects of life here, even in the wine production industry. Everybody felt the pain of being excluded um, from that. But uh, eventually we were able to prevail and look forward. What can we do as a collective, you know, as a country, as a, as a city, to bring about you know, a better life for everybody? The whole approach with, with, with Black Empowerment is to redress the, the imbalance you know, that, was, that was created by the apartheid system. You know, we, we still have a population of, of South Africa in total, about 75% black people, you know, and, and uh, who really don't have any real share you know, in, 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 in a country in terms of, of resources and, and wealth. You know, and, and, and the whole black empowerment was to redress the balance so that everybody can have an equal opportunity. If you don't have land, you know, how, how can you how can you produce something that is sustainable, you know, and, and how, how can you be sustainable economically? It's really about people that have been there, who have the experience, you know, to take the hands and, and bring, bring those black people into the transfer of skill and the mentorship to make sure it does 
that does survive, you know, be sustainable in the end, you know, and, and, uh, and, and contribute. And our success today as Africa's biggest black owned exporter of wine is based on being fair trade. Because we sell 95% of our wines go to the export market. Tan is about 250 families now. It's a, it's a black collective spanning over three farms. Before 94, that will be really unheard of. Um, yeah, so at least we, we're taking the charge uh, and showing the world that uh, yeah, we can do it. The potential of the local agriculture is astonishing, and a new generation is taking over to help Cape Town continue its evolution. Born in Zimbabwe, 26-year-old Cameron Monroe is part of the new generation, breathing new life into the city. In the tiny neighborhood of Woodstock, this young entrepreneur has created a cafe, an art gallery, and the largest and friendliest farmer's market in the country. I think it's very exciting because, you know, I mean, the last couple of years, you've seen so much change and so much growth, and, and things are definitely getting better. There are a lot of hiccups and challenges that we still need to get over, but, you know, I think everyone's very positive about the growth in this country and where we're going, and I think the youth are an important part of that. With almost half of the 3.4 million residents of Cape Town under the age of 24, youth culture is definitely a driving force. Would you say Cape Town in 2010 is a land of opportunity? I do, I do. I think um, it's also going to open sort of like people's eyes here to see like, you know, like what's going on and how many people there are actually and so on. Because you can, I mean, especially Cape Town, it, it is a city, but it's often described as a little village. A village. Exactly what I felt about this warm and friendly place when I arrived. Woodstock's community is being redefined by Cameron and his associate. It's quite an interesting area in the fact that it's remained quite undeveloped for the last number of years. Even though it's right on the edge of the city CBD, it was almost logical that it would start to be developed because it's so close to the city centre. It's going through a lot of changes, especially in the last six months to a year. When we first moved here, there weren't many businesses and stuff that were taking place. Very kind of old industrial buildings and factories and shops and stuff. But um, it's definitely changing and, and growing. But I just don't want it to lose that special character of what it's, what it's always been. Like your mom and pop stores that have been here for like 50 years. Is this typical Woodstock? Yeah, it's kind of very like these little close, sort of like small little houses, very close here. Normally bright colours like that as well. I do like the, the sort of character it has. It's also about the people that live in these houses. We've been living here for years as well, so... It's raw and real. Yeah, exactly. Hey, on the streets, it's totally raw and real, so... So all these young people in Cape Town, is it a post-apartheid baby boom? One thing that's happened since apartheid is that there's been a huge influx of people moving from sort of rural areas. They called them homelands during apartheid, which was like areas of South Africa where black people were forced to live. And uh, they could only leave those areas to come and work in the cities and stuff. Then they had to go back to those areas. So they were very much kept there. And once apartheid ended, we had all these sort of like these areas and like these, these families that like, you know, obviously like, Rural life was a bit of a struggle and it was much, it was almost like the streets were paved with gold in the city. So people like migrated to the city. So you had this huge influx of people moving to like the metropolitan areas. The end of apartheid was a monumental step for South Africans. But with an illiteracy rate of 23%, Cape Town still struggles to educate its population. There are still remnants of apartheid, but it's now changing. I mean, obviously now over this period of time, as we're getting further and further away from the end of apartheid, um, you're seeing the, the, the benefits and the fruits of, of how people are developing more and getting a better education and experiencing kind of like sort of like um, a, a better lifestyle and, and um, the housing situation is getting better. So with all that comes a different mindset. The younger generation are definitely getting a better sort of a like chance of being, you know, educated and experiencing what the privileged, more privileged people, white people in this country experience uh, during apartheid. <laughs> Tenzi acha zoku pa jiremba.
We have 11 official languages in South Africa. You have to do a tribal language? You have to do a tribal language, yeah. You do English, you do Afrikaans. And uh, depending on what sort of geographical area you are in South Africa, the people in this area speak Kosa, which is the, uh, the local language here spoken. And then depending where you are in the country, like there's Zulu, there's Sutu, there's Tsuani, there's 11 official languages. But the market's over here, so okay. we'll take a walk across. The Neighbor Goods Market, built in 2006, attracts thousands from all corners of the city. First started very much a focus with food vendors, and from then we also started creating a platform for young designers as well. So food is in housed in the big old Victorian warehouse, and then we've got some new tents under the silo where uh, we showcase young designers' work, young jewelry designers, fashion designers, shoemakers, all local, all young, mostly contemporary as well. Although the surrounding streets are not the safest place to be, the ambiance within the market is truly intoxicating. So as you can see, it takes place in this old Victorian warehouse here. And yeah, we've got over 150 vendors. Welcome. The market plays host to over 100 merchants and tradespeople. Farmers, bakers, fruit growers, winemakers, clothing designers. I've never tasted anything like it. It's like a nice meeting point for like the community of Cape Town. Like we, we've we've created this style of seating that you're forced to sit next to a stranger. You don't sit at your own little table on a straw on a straw bale covered in cover. I mean a straw bale covered in, in plastic. But yeah, you're forced to sit next to a stranger, meet people, engage with conversation. We want this. To, we want to force this a bit. You know, it creates conversation with people, and there's nothing better than meeting new people over a nice bowl of wine, some good food. <laughs> It's hard to disagree. The quality of life here is exceptional. And with such a majestic wilderness, it really is hard to run out of things to discover. Derek Beauchard knew, when he left the safaris to move to Cape Town, that he would not have to leave behind his love of nature. In this breathtaking city, where ocean and mountain are one, Derek suggests we have a picnic on top of Table Mountain. Because, he says, you don't come to Cape Town without spending at least a day up there. You could go from the water to the bottom of the mountain in 10 minutes by car, uh, but then to climb up the mountain, that's another story. That takes about two hours. If it's a hot afternoon like this, the better option is to take the cable car. It's a lot quicker and you get to enjoy the view as well without breaking a sweat. It's going to be hot up there, isn't it? Uh, it might be a little bit cooler on the top of the mountain because it's so high at a thousand meters above sea level. It's amazing, hey? Cape Town, sea level, on top of the mountain, a thousand meters. All right, let's go. How long does it take to get up in the cable car? It's quite a quick ride, seven or eight minutes. And it's two hours to walk from the bottom of the hill up or from here up? From here, where we are now, it takes about two hours to get to the top. With so, a mountain to climb and an ocean to swim in, you know, really there's really mountain. no excuse to be out of shape. Um, looking back at the geology of Table Mountain, it used to be an island and the sea, the waves actually used to break on, on the cliff face. So um, as the seas have subsided, and also with the geological processes, Table Mountain has been pushed up. There's a microclimate here. What does it do uh, to? There's a lot of little microclimate differences all over the, the place around Cape Town. The city bowl itself with all the big buildings, um, the tar and concrete and everything, that obviously generates quite a lot of heat. So you'll find the city bowl itself is is typically probably five degrees warmer, if not more, than the outlying areas. Um, and what's fascinating is it can be beautiful and sunny on this side of the mountain, but you go around to the other side of the mountain and it's pouring with rain. So as a rock climber, you can imagine this is a climbing paradise. 
So apart from rock climbing, what does Cape Town have to offer? It's kind of challenging some days. You wake up in the morning and you, you're not too sure what to do. Uh, do I go climbing? Do I go mountain biking? Do I go road cycling? Do I go for a paddle in the ocean? Um, paragliding? Look at this view, it's amazing. Wow. How fun is this right in the center of your city? You can just come up here in five minutes. Cape Town is a paradise city. It's quite possible to finish work, even on a work day in summer when the days are very long, to come up the mountain, maybe have some, some sundown or drinks on the top with a few friends and in, enjoy the view. It's really fantastic. Either up here or down there on the beach. That one's Camps Bay and That's what Camps else? Bay. And that other little area, yeah. that's Clifton. And um, those are typically the ones that are more sheltered from the wind, whereas the other beaches are, do get a bit of wind when the southeaster kicks in. You, you know, you've got the two oceans converging along the Cape coastline. You've got the cold Atlantic Ocean and the warm Indian Ocean. And where those waters churn and mix, there are big temperature differences, obviously. The cold water running underneath the city from the ocean, that affects the climate as well. The climate of Cape Town is very much affected by, by the ocean. The cold Atlantic, often uh, cold fronts come through and you can have a day as gorgeous as this and tomorrow you wake up and you can't see the mountain. It's completely gone, hiding behind a huge dense cloud of fog. The tablecloth? The tablecloth, exactly. Um, it's, it's quite a beautiful sight to see as well. It, it kind of looks like a big white cloth being pulled over Table Mountain. Heidi, I think uh, we should just take a little hike on top of the mountain first because it's so beautiful. So we're looking out south over Cape Point and uh, beautiful protected mountains. Magnificent. No surprise then that this spectacular mountain was granted the status of World Heritage Site. Robben Island also has that status and this makes Cape Town the only place in the world where two such sites are visible from one another. This is a very diverse place. I mean, looking out here, you, it's hard to believe that we're in the heart of Cape Town, isn't it? Yeah. And as far as we can see, it's all Cape Town? Yeah, um, I guess we'd call it the Greater Cape Town. Um, we've got the City Bowl on the one side, and, and then all the other suburbs stretching out. It's all pretty much Cape Town. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but we're still in the center of the city in an area of 90,000 square kilometers there's 8,500 species of flowering plants and as you know the cape floral kingdom is is very um, rich and diverse but it needs to be protected 8,500 species that's one fifth of all the plant species on the continent of africa more than all the species in new zealand or the british isles great I'm going to help you down here, okay? What do you think? This is a nice Beautiful. spot, huh? Yeah. We're in the middle of a city, and we're sitting on a beautiful mountain, a national park, looking down over this beautiful harbour. Um, what's not to love, you know? Just the other morning, before work, got up early, went down to the waterfront, jumped into the water with the surf ski, and two minutes being out on the water there was a school of dolphins in fact two schools of dolphins and they were chasing each other around so there I was paddling along and the dolphins are diving out of the water next to me it was really amazing and five minutes later there was a little group of penguins as well so they're lovely little things they're only small African penguins um, so it, it's amazing and had a shower got in the car and then I was in the office a bit of a bit of a damper on the whole situation, but you know we've got to earn our keep as well. So, <laughs> Cape Town is a truly unique city, unique in its geography, its history, and its people. 
It's hard to imagine this quiet city being such a flashpoint in our recent history. The scars of the past can still be felt in places, but the tidal wave of youth will build a new and better way of life. The seeds of democracy have grown slowly, but now they've taken root here between the mountain and the sea. After emerging from darkness, the city is reintroducing itself to the world. With its vibrancy, originality, optimism, and youth, it's no question that for Cape Town, the best is yet to come.